<clears throat> All right, welcome back, everybody, for another fun, exciting episode of Friday live streaming. Let me make sure my sound is working. Okay. We're good, I believe. All right. So I am still working on this painting from the last, I think, couple weeks, seven working on this on the live stream here and you know throughout the week as well and so i'm going to i've done a lot of work on this dress area up here and i'm going to work on the guy and i'm going to bring some some of this color that's like this warmer tone onto parts of this character i'm going to be fixing his hand and doing different things on this so I will get started with that. So, um, just see if I want to reset my um, live stream. So, a little bit more of a, the detail of what I'm working on a little easier, maybe. So, all right. Let's see, <laughs> double check my my focuses. Let's see. There we go. All right, that's looking better. Okay, cool. I'm also showing more of my palette today too. So not just my palette, but like my little workstation here. Can't quite see my brushes, which are set up over here. But I don't know. I just thought it might be interesting to see more stuff here. So, um. <laughs> One of the things that I like to try to do in my paintings is to um, be very selective on what kind of information I'm giving. So like a lot of the preparatory work involved might be pretty elaborate, gathering lots and lots of information, you know, like all the photo references and lots of sketches and details and like belt buckles and like all the, all the things I can put together to set up the vibe I'm going for in a painting. So like when I have uh set up for a painting i'll have models pose i'll set up the lighting um so with wardrobe and all this there and, and props and all stuff and then the idea is how do i distill all of this information into the most essential information in, in a painting uh without having to over explain itself and what i mean by that is there's a sense to put in lots of details into things when the details don't really do anything for you, they don't, um, they just explain stuff. And often the more you paint in those kind of details and more information you put into it, the less there is for the viewer to really project themselves into a piece, uh, to understand, you know, like, to be part of it, to, to, figure things out that, that's going on, like what's what's going on in the story or what's going on, you know, it leaves less to the imagination, the more information you put. So the goal is to put as little information as possible and maybe a lot, a lot of the detail will be where you want a viewer to focus on uh, the sort of focal point of, a, of the piece. So I'm going to <laughs> start mixing some colors here. So I'm just running my mouth. Yeah, it's really hard to do both at the same time, but you know, so this is practicing here, I guess. So I can chew gum and paint at the same time. <laughs> Something like that. All right. So I'm still working on the same. I thought about um, cleaning my palette and starting with fresh things for this session, but then I thought, I, I don't want to do that. <laughs> so, so inherently a little, there's less as I can. So I'm going to see where I can get started with this. And so you want to, you know, or I'll say, I say you, but what I mean is, what I want to do here, and when I say you, it's like the royal you. So I'm like 
you know, <laughs> it's figurative, I guess. So anyway, I want to um, get as much information out of as little possible um, mark making as possible. Like, so I don't, if I can, so like if I can paint an eye in three brush strokes versus 20, I want to do it in three brush strokes. And what this kind of approach to the painting means is that um, you tend to really consider everything about each brushstroke you're putting down, like um, the angle, like the, the it's it's a whole mark, like it's not you're just filling in space, you're using creative marks to imply something that is an illusion. So every mark has to have some sort of like purpose. Well, not everyone, but the ones around places where it's important. And so it, it turns into an organization of um, brushwork and variations of brushwork. What kind of marks can you make with different types of brushes? Um, like one of the things I like to do when I'm painting drapery is that drapery tends to fold in space. So I like to use a flat brush so that I can um, make different marks with the, with, with the same brush and the same stroke. I can make a fat to a thin line with one brush rather than trying, like anytime you can do something with one paint stroke rather than two or three or four, like that's where I want to aim for is that sort of really simplicity and efficiency of uh, mark making. Um, it's fun to do. It's, it's tricky to to do that. But it, so what ends up happening is that you're starting to create this illusion of detail and things that aren't there because when you get close to it. it falls apart into brush strokes. But when you step back, it looks like something's really there and it's, it's, it's a trip. <laughs> and so I, I like having these illusions of things. That's one of the reasons I have a lot of the abstract type backgrounds in my paintings is to create this sort of illusion of an environment, something that's, you know, the characters are inhabiting. Okay, I'm going to change his hand up quite a bit, so I'm going to do some just heavy-handed strokes to kind of work from the simple shapes down into the more complicated things. So I'm I'm always working towards any detail that's in in a painting is always something that I'm working towards, not something that I'm starting with. So it's like you know you don't want to start with a logo if you're starting a business. That's that's a detail. You want to start with um, some, <laughs> something, you know, or, you know, if you're creating a brand for yourself as an artist, you know, you don't start with the logo, you start with the work. And, um, you start, you start with the, the most broad aspect of what you're doing, which, you know, in this painting, I want to create the shape, the shape of the hand in relationship to the shape of the face. So instead of painting details of his face around and painting his fingers in and, I'm going to try to kind of go back to the color I was working with last week, and now I have to figure that out again. <laughs> but I'll, I'll figure that out. We might switch that color up. I don't know if I want to make it darker, though. So anyways, I'm going to start blocking this in, sort of matching what I had already and if it's not exact it's not that big a deal so anyway you get the idea so I want his face over here I think I had more violet in it or purple or something let's see that's closer
And when I'm starting on a on a piece, I you know, or not on a, necessarily starting on the piece, but starting in a, the start of a session on a painting, doing something that has more broad strokes to it, so to speak, tends to get you loosened up a bit. So I like to start with something loose generally. I don't remember exactly what colors I used to mix this background here. As, you know, in this character, I remember vaguely. This is probably, you know, something I should have uh, focused on a little bit more before I stopped last time I was working on this part of the character. Like, the, it, the more you can sort of get resolved in one session, you know, on a particular area, sometimes it's better. But I felt I had it to a good spot last week, and then I was looking at the hand. I didn't like the placement of the hand and a few other things, so I figured I would just kind of rework this part of the painting. So the method that I use of just sort of freestyling it up here, um, one of the drawbacks is that you end up seeing things that you probably should have changed it. You know, if you're doing a detailed drawing before, you might, you'll avoid these sort of uh, issues, but I don't mind going back in and reworking, uh, repainting stuff. It's a uh, part of the excite, kind of exciting part is like you get to explore these different variations of the work as it goes along and it kind of mutates and transforms in front of you as your idea kind of you, idea forms along the, along the journey of making the painting and you um, you end up with something that's even better than you first conceived of sometimes So it goes back to like the idea of having something to explore in each painting. I like paintings that just sort of uh, allow me to explore different things with, like a lot of technical stuff. Like I want to try a different palette set. You know, like I find a pigment color, the art supply store that looks interesting and. And I'll try to figure out how to use it and start uh, start a piece with that sort of new color that I found as a sort of pivot point around the entire palette of the painting. I'm kind of doing that with this a little bit. I found these these dioxins being purple before, but the blue I've never used, and I feel like I haven't used a lot of blues in my painting, so. Going back into that and seeing if, uh, you know, what I kind of find there. It's weird, I still tend to find myself going back to these sort of habits of red, and red versus greens a lot. So I'm always, you know, like when I'm thinking in terms of color, I'm thinking of, uh, Complementary colors a lot. And in fact, I, all my neutral tones I used to just mix with complementary colors, which is a very, you know, complicated way to get all your neutral tones. It takes sometimes it because you're relying on the the value structures of the the, na the native value structures of or values of each color. So if you wanted a light gray, you know, reds and greens are darker generally. So you'd, you'd have to modulate with all kinds of other variations of these colors to get lighter colors and using white or other um, colors to lighten the pigment up. Um, I've since found that it's just simpler to use the, the gray, mix the grays first and then mix the colors in with the grays. And lately I've been going back to mixing a lot more of my neutrals with, with especially with this painting, with um, complementary colors and then I'm working with you know temperature shifts and stuff like the variations of color inside this character 
not quite matching right now. But solving those puzzles is what some of the fun of the painting is, is trying to make everything look like you did it on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> You're making something look like you did it without effort, <laughs> struggle, and and wailing and gnashings of teeth. The fun of that is sometimes you get into a piece and everything just like comes together. Like some paintings you struggle with and can't get things to work right for various reasons. And then sometimes there's just something that just almost like it makes itself. And uh, those are really, that's, that's when it gets to be really fun, I think. That's the joy of painting. <laughs> like you find uh, certain keys in, in these palettes that help you to sort of make a both an intuitive and a, and a quick and a what rational choice and what colors to use to like it's almost like it just becomes really obvious and it's it's almost like math or something or it's like I'm not making precise measurements of colors but I know that it just it's like it needs to be a little greener a little cooler or something like that and then I the colors are already on the palette it's just a matter of kind of dialing it in and then uh, you kind of find a it's like a little pattern and sometimes you can get lost in those little tunnels you come back a little bit later and look at you know you, you step away and look at it you, you got all lost and focus on one part of the painting and it doesn't really match the entire painting So that's the other kind of key is to working on areas of the painting, but then keeping the entire painting in mind at the same time as, as you're working on it so that it works both in certain segments, and, but then as a whole as well. So sometimes you might have a piece where you, you know something's not quite right and you can't quite figure out what it is. And, and um and sometimes it's it's something mi minor that uh it's hard to tell that the small area or one small tweak of something is what's given given it visually so many problems and so one of the things tricks that i've done is i will take my hand like this and i will look through it like a little telescope and i'll just go scan the entire painting and when you look at it that way, you just sometimes a little thing will pop out as not working for some reason. It'll jump out a little easier because you basically separate the rest of the painting and you're looking at it through a peephole. And I've done that to help figure out and solve issues and where, and it also help you figure out like, okay, this part of the painting is working and you start to sort of triangulate where the problem is, is coming from, like on a compositional or, or some sort of other technical reason. You know, so you're like looking at your painting through a toilet roll tube or something. But like the details, I like to see how many details I can leave out. Like what, what can you get away with and, and uh, how little can you put down and make it read properly? Like. What's the real basic ne ne necessary information that the viewer needs to have 
Because the way we tend to see things is that our brain just makes stuff up on its first glance. Like, I don't know if you're, like, if you've dr driven a car down the, the highway or something and you see something either in the road, on the side of the road, and it looks like a lump, and you immediately think, well, that looks like maybe a run-over dog, and then you get close to it, it's just a, like a black trash bag or something in the, in the, in the, in the uh, road. And that's kind of what I'm getting at, is that our, where our brain jumps to conclusions about things and fills in missing information based on its own experiences and other things, you, know, like, you know, whatever our brain tends to catalog. And so, if you make the right sort of marks in this, on, a, on a, a part of a painting, it will get, be enough information for somebody's brain to fill in the blanks. They don't have to see every wrinkle on somebody's finger for them to understand that it's a hand. And, you know, that part of the painting may not be important enough to want to put all that kind of detail in uh, into the part of that painting. So. I, I find that generally, if I'm getting too much focus on detail, or you know, especially finishing a painting, it's mostly because the painting probably doesn't have uh, some something else that's better about it. You know, it's like I think sometimes we tend to focus on details when we have uh, nothing else to say that's of real importance. You know, visually. I mean, I'm not not that something has to be really important, but there's some sort of lacking or something missing, and so what we do is we fill it with information instead of, um, I think, what tends to need to be done, which is to take away stuff that isn't important, so only the things that are important come forward in the painting. Like what is the what is the essence of what what the sub you know like what is the essence of of what you're making a painting or a drawing about what is the vibe the overall emotional quality of something like um, that's that's generally where my mind is at when I'm working on something like you know not necessarily does it look technically correct but does it feel correct But I, I like to have work that has an emotional quality to it. Um, I, I think I call, I call it emotional, but it's not really an emotional. It's just mainly uh, not, like, if you think about, like, nonverbal communication that we have with each other, the, the body posing and how much information we get from just um, how somebody stands and their body language. So rather than make a painting of somebody who is obviously angry and they have their hands in front of their face and they're screaming like what's how can you convey that idea in a way that is uh, basic and doesn't require uh, some sort of obvious uh, expression you, you know how can you make someone look like they're happy by just the way they're sitting there so I I like to you know that's where I find that it's fun to try to to get to with, with uh, what the piece might be communicating. It's it's in the bones. It's not in it's not in the um, details or the technique or all that. All that stuff is almost secondary. If if the painting has a connection to people that is um, visceral in a way. At least that's what I found. Boop, boop, boop. All right, so I think I've reworked his hand and I like it. It's in a better spot. Now I'm gonna touch up on his face and like a good example of uh, less is more is um, especially when it comes into figurative work. I found that like. If I paint like this figure and I painted and detailed his face out really well and you could see all of his eyelids and stuff, it wouldn't have the same impact as me leaving it obscure because with, and, and with little detail, just little vague information, 
Because what happens is when you have vagary there of information, the, the viewer's mind will tend to invent uh, and put in place things there. Uh, you know, start making up stories about what it's looking at. And I think that's fun in a painting when you are compelled to wonder what it is exactly that it's, that's there. So it allows, it allows your viewer to have, you know, to utilize their imagination and participate in the work that you're creating. And I kind of found that it, the more I can do that in a paint in, in the work overall, uh, I think the more it can it connects with people, and they they are able to sort of see their own circumstance in the painting, whether they're seeing themselves or somebody they're reminded of. It allows it allows sort of a connection where they can feel like they get it because they're seeing something they they understand intuitively, but not with you know not necessarily with uh, with, with words. At least that's what I, I think. I, I don't, <laughs> you know, that's the weird thing. It's like you never know why people like your work. It might be something very much simpler, but. All right. All right, let's see here. I want to sort of change the tone of it a bit. may or may not work so I'm just going to kind of work this warmer tone in here huh still got to figure how I'm going to do this All right. I want to do something over here. It needs to be lighter. Let's see. Like I know there's a thing that's going to work here and it's just a matter of figuring out what it is and I think I might know. What I'm doing is I'm trying to mix a color in there. I think if I just went more neutral with it, that's going to read. That's like too bright. So, you just keep playing with it until you stumble onto it. Hmm. All right. 
Yeah, I think I want that to be a little more violet like that. <laughs> so I tell everybody not to get into details and I'm spending all this time on this finger. So yeah, I want that to be a gray color, I think, but not quite so light. this kind of working Yeah, so I'm just repainting back over these fingers here. I'm having fun with this, so I'm kind of going slow. I should probably like just kind of work through this a little bit quicker. I, sometimes when I do that, I move uh, faster. I actually end up making better brushwork because then I'm not sitting around overthinking what I'm doing. Um, trying to make the perfect brush stroke. So that's how you can kind of get in your own ways. If you, like I'm kind of giving these principal ideas while I'm doing it, and then I'm getting focused on those ideas, <laughs> and 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 um, what's what's what I'm, what's what I'm, how do I put this? Like you start um, micromanaging yourself, trying to have a like a perfect performance, or you know like just right and then like you really want to screw something up try not to make screw ups that's <laughs> and so I find when I can get my I catch myself doing that I will um, do something else to pull myself away from it like I'll just start working faster or I'll get a different brush um, sometimes it's just the self-awareness that I'm getting caught up in something that isn't important in the painting and overthinking something instead of just kind of putting it to the side moving on to the next part of the painting again like, like how much time do i want to spend like painting the the thumb of a guy's hand in a painting that isn't about the thumb of his hand so first place has got to read is like you know an overall hand and the fingers and etc. So what I was getting away from was um, not focusing on the, it's just the, the overall, like what's going on here before I get caught up in rendering fingertips and stuff like that. So it's got to read as an overall shape of a hand and all the value structures in the right kind of spot. And then the color you can modulate and change after the fact even. It's probably a little easier to do it, to do it that way. So I'm going to 
to a little touch up in here. Okay. Gonna get a little bit bigger brush and see if we go around hand again. Gonna tidy it up. Simplify that down a little bit. Yeah. All right, we go. Yeah, I want to start kind of bringing some of that warmth onto his jacket a little bit. So let's figure out what that's going to look like. Oh yeah, I was going to bring up something that I was thinking about. Um, as I reach out to my friend Chet to like for ideas about what to talk talk about some of these streams, you know, like in case I get lost or something. And uh, one of the things that came up was like the uh, have the attitude that you have, um, both. You know, kind of towards your own art, not necessarily in the making of the art. You can have, I guess, whatever attitude that suits you. But like, I've what I've seen sink people who are trying to make a living with their art is um, a lot of it's just the the attitude that they that they take to things. Um, some of that is just, you know, not like they have a bad attitude as you know, like this some sort of character flaw, but. Like for example, I'm I I remember artists I would sell with, out on not only on the boardwalk but at festivals and things like that, and sometimes the show would just be going bad or the sale the day or whatever, There'd be no sales and and it's hard not to get really frustrated, especially if you're trying to make a living on it and you just have crowds of people coming up to you and. Or, or ignoring you and just nothing's going your way and it, it, it just you know you get grumpy and people can sense that grumpiness and once you fall into that sort of <laughs> spiral you start pushing people away with your own attitude and that happened you know like when we were selling at shows because people could walk by your booth and just see you sitting back there with your arms crossed the resting bitch face and mad at the world you know just mad because things weren't going right and and then when you see people like kind of react to you and they walk away from you even faster, you get makes you even more upset. And, <laughs> and so it's just like one of these weird self fulfilling prophecies of things are going not as well as I'd like them to. And, and uh, the more you express that outwardly, the more it fulfills itself and continues to happen. So like, um, so that's, that's one way that, it, Especially if you're selling in person or if you're dealing at an event, is uh, you 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 kind of have to um, been in Grant Grant Barrett sometimes. So it doesn't mean you have to pretend that you're not upset. But what I would start doing if I was at a live event is instead of getting sitting there looking grumpy, I would get up and start moving stuff in my booth around or doing something because then they're not. When people are walking in, they're not seeing you in your attitude, just sitting there like it looks like you might, you know, yell at them if they ask you a question or something. So it's best just to look busy so people don't notice that right away. And they're not, they're not, you know, you're not upstaging your own work with, with, um, whatever mood you're in. And the other sort of atti attitude towards it, I, I, I think, is is um, being able to look at things kind of ob objectively 
rather rather than um, so like an example is like sometimes I, I see artists have a tendency to downplay or dog on other artists who are they think are you know who are doing something successful but they think that it's not very good work it's just like crap stuff or whatever whatever that is there's sort of an attitude to look down on 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 work that might be kitschy that um, is way successful and you can't figure it out like why your really awesome work isn't isn't uh, taken off and everybody will spend lots of money on this nonsense right um, I found that when I got rid of that attitude myself and I started assuming that the people doing this work were somewhat like me and they were probably making the work that they like to make and and achieving the goals they wanted to achieve doing the work they like um, it takes some of that you know, uh, sort of uh, you versus the world attitude out. And then I started looking at, you know, what it was that they were doing that was successful. You know, why was it, why was it working and how could I apply that to what I'm doing? Like the sort of mentality of if, if they can do it then, and then I can do it too and I can do it better. You know, that's sort of the attitude that I started taking towards things. Instead of, um, having a, a sort of a jealous attitude towards people who were really successful or more successful than me. And I, I, when I took that attitude, it seemed to, I seemed to find ways to do things better myself. And uh, it just feels better, it's just better to let go of that sort of attitude that like somebody else is getting something that they don't deserve because <laughs> It deserves got nothing to do with it. You know, you can work your ass off and not it not pay off too. There's there's always that possibility. But um, I think that if you know, like. You know, I'm not trying to control everything too much. And, you know, I get to a, just be happy with, with what you are doing in life or with your work. That's pretty much what you, all there is to it. Maybe that doesn't make any sense, but. Yeah, the the um, changing of my attitudes towards things like, you know, I'm not saying that you shouldn't be negative or anything like that, but um, I would say that instead of thinking about it as terms of n positive or negative attitude, that it would be more like you have a um, you know, like a it works. It's a uh, like more of a neutral attitude towards it. I think I lost my train of thought there. <laughs> what more of this green in there? Let's see. Nope, don't like that either. Yeah, you're not competing with other artists. That's one of the things I learned down on the boardwalk is that I was set up right next to hundreds of other artists and None of us were losing sales to the other person. Like people don't generally, you know, just you know they don't. They're going to buy from you or, or collect your work. They're going to do it. They're not going to do it because 
somebody right next to you has got even better work. So if somebody is, uh, you know, selling more work or they are getting more claim or whatever, that, then you can understand. It's just you don't understand it. That's what it boils down to. It's like sometimes people come from, you know, there's been work that <laughs> puzzled me, but I had to like give them credit. They they found like I would have never guessed some of the things I saw people sell at festivals, but. There they were, and they were cranking it in. But those those kind of things are opportunities to learn. Like, if something that you think isn't very good is doing so well, how is that happening? And if something that isn't very good can sell, or something you don't like can can do so well, then certainly you can figure out how you know imagine what it would do if you applied it to what you're doing so you're i'm always looking to like those something's working really well like i like to figure out what's going on like how are they doing it and is there anything that i can use from understanding what they're doing and apply it to my own my own practice whatever it is so like and and you'll find lots of things that work for other people will work for you too. So it's kind of looking cool. I don't know. So I could have left this character completely silhouetted in the background and. Um, but what I wanted to do is bring some of these tones down in down in here, so he wasn't so isolated. Like, uh, like they got to look like they're in the same environment somehow. So I've got to work all the colors that are in here from this light source somehow have got to be represented in, on this character. So that's kind of what I'm aiming at. But I'm kind of <laughs> spacing out as I'm thinking here and stumbling across other things and you know you know so like a lot of things I'm talking about it's like I talked about detail in the work and trying to have a less is more approach um, I don't always do that though so I've just found you know I'm not trying well I guess I'm kind of saying like this isn't really like a how-to like I'm not suggesting that that's what you must do to like um, Improve your art or whatever it is, but I, I I found in my own work that when that happens, when I like the the work that I think you know, and I look back and I'm like, man, that's pretty cool. I don't even know how I did it. It has that quality of of it's, it's so simple. Like I don't even know how to thought to make that brush stroke or like it's like almost like you can surprise yourself that I don't know how I would have done it again. Like I don't know how I did it. Like even right now, like I, this is something I haven't really focused on that much. I'm doing this sort of weird dry brush. With a, I'm pressing the flat of my brush and just dragging it across instead of using the tip of my brush to to. to uh, so I, there's this texture in this jacket that I want to like emulate, and that looks like a cool way to do it. Well, that's a little bright, but I think this painting's overall dark, so I think I could probably work up. Some of these tones even brighter if I wanted to like accentuate them. It's gonna be a button over here. This jacket. So stumbling across cool ways, cool new ways to do something. Um, the painting is just me having fun <laughs> I kind of figured out like if you can do this as a, a living you figure out how to have fun for a living but then there's the problem of now you got to have fun on purpose 
and you can play all kinds of mind games with that. <laughs> This is kind of cool. It's kind of looking like his jacket. Looking pretty badass. This is been interesting here. So the structure's got to look, you know, like the texture of this trench coat, the fabric, but it's also got to describe the form of the body underneath. So that it looks like it's a person rather than just detail on a surface. So this detail serves a couple of function. With this, this color, it serves the function of describing the form and of um, putting it in its, in the environment, you know, in a certain space in the environment with a reflection of the light coming from here. I might lighten this these tones up later. Not quite sure. But I'm not quite sure. It's like I'm not quite sure how far I want to push those before it starts becoming, you know, heavy-handed. Um, Textures on this sleeve over here. Yeah, there we go. It's... So that's going to have to get unified, I think. So now I have like a bunch of just scattered things. So now it's got, I got to kind of bring things together. Go with a cooler tone on top of it. Painting is really dark. You need to lighten up some areas. Yeah, keep keep things simple. So I, even though this is somewhat a bunch of hash mark, I'm probably gonna come through and like sometimes I I start it isn't simple the way I start something, but I I will paint over it with simpler brush strokes. I'll start just kind of connecting things together. 
so I don't have too much just random um, and that'll probably come when I start taking and mixing the the cooler background color in with um in with the these darker or these orange tones so I'll have to start bringing everything kind of more together depending on where I want things to pop out a little bit more than others So yeah, it's just a push and pull of, of the things. There we go. Then when I paint paint the buttons in here, I think it'll like it'll probably make a little bit more sense. Oh, he's just stepping in to some of this light and just catching some of his jacket and different things. Yeah, there we go. Nope. There you go. Yeah, it's kind of cool. Kind of. Kind of getting there. Let's see if I want to like do something with the sleeve out here. Don't like that. I'm going to hit this bluer color up there. Okay, let's see. I need a light. Yeah, there we go. Yep, something like that. And I'm going to come around and sort of hit the outside of his jacket here. And I think I'm going to stop right there for today. Uh, all right. I will uh, hopefully catch you next Friday. Let me know if there's anything you'd like me to discuss in future streams or any feedback would be helpful. So if you can do that, it'd be awesome. All right.